I'm excited about the uh, equipping hour for the next uh, month or so. We're going to be looking at James, the book of James, chapter, chapters 3 and 4. And this has been a, a really rich section for my own heart, for my own meditation recently. And uh, so I was excited when there was a little opportunity to jump in and do some stuff with equipping hour. So um, Lord willing, we'll do this for four or five weeks and uh, just see how far we can get through these two chapters. Um, let's just begin with a word of prayer and then we'll dive in. Father, we thank you so much for the grace that you have shown to us in Christ. And Lord, every, every Sunday when we gather as your church, we're just constantly reminded that how manifold your grace really is because we see how you've given us all the riches of grace and kindness. You've shown this to us in the person of Christ and, and you manifest uh, and a limitless extent of grace to us, especially as we start to think about the very specific way in which you've been gracious to us um, by giving us your word and by giving us a, a sufficient scripture, the amount of truth that is always useful and effective. It always has the answers. It always has hope. It always has uh, correction. It always has instruction. It always has promise. We think about the manifold grace that you've shown to us in Christ, especially as we think about the Lord's Day when we gather as your church and we, we have the benefit of seeing the diversity of gifts. Here we, we gather as your people and we get to open up your word and spend time together and fellowship together. And Lord, the amount of grace that we receive through the gifts of this church are, are limitless as well. And we think about uh, how how profound of a blessing it is to be part of a church where there's unity in the diversity of gifting and we, we find our unity under the truth. And so here we gather in an equipping hour and we get to look at your word and our, our prayer is this, this morning, if I could pray for not only this equipping hour but for the next four or five, that we would be able to see the grace of your word changing us as a body, as a congregation, uh, that it would make us what we are not yet, especially as we think about uh, this topic that James is focusing on of uh, what it means to really have a, a living faith and what a living faith would look like in, in a congregation. I pray that this would um, refine us, that it would expose us, that it would make us whole, it would simplify our thinking and our focus, that it would cause us to uh, grow in humility and in effectiveness, that it would uh, loosen our grip on this world, and we would see uh, the prevailing power of grace overcoming desires in our hearts. And so, Lord, we just thank you so much for the power of your word, and you just show us your glory and your power and your greatness time and time and time again. And so we just pray this morning that uh, you would do that, minister to us in a profound way as we look at this text. In your name we pray, amen. Well, if you haven't already, grab your Bibles and open up to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. And um, I want to I look at this, this uh, section here. We're going we're gonna to devote our time this morning to chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. And I want to go ahead and read... Um, chapter 3, all the way through chapter 4, verse 10. I, I, I want this section to be in our minds because it's so important to consider what James is doing. And before we read this, I'll even highlight and remind us of, of what we've looked at recently. And, 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 and by the way, I wanted to say this. I, I've, I was extremely encouraged. I got to um, pull uh, uh, the binder, the James binder that the, the ladies are doing a James study, and I pulled that off the shelf, and, and it was just it was so encouraging. It was just such a sweet resource. And so I know some of you ladies are studying James. Uh, I also looked at the uh, media player, and I know Josh preached the book of James. And so, um, you know, this is, this is certainly not um, something that I was sitting there thinking like, boy, we got to make some corrections here. Uh, it was just James 3 and 4 had just been impacting me so profoundly that when there was a little opportunity to do some um, uh, instruction and some study in the equipping hour, I, I jumped at the opportunity because I was really eager to start focusing uh, on this text and on this section. 
And, um, and those resources were incredibly encouraging, both Joshua's expositions and um, the, 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 the James study that the ladies are doing. So hopefully this is just an encouragement for you um, in, in a text that might be very familiar. But at the same time, even though Josh taught this years ago, uh, it, 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 it bears being repeated and it bears being looked at over and over and over again. It's just such a powerful, powerful section of scripture. So Having said that, let's just dive in. I'm going to read chapter 3 all the way through 4.10. James writes this, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouths, so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also, though they are so great and are driven by strong winds and are still directed by very, a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire? And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of, bird, of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives, or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. And James continues in verse 13. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show his good behavior by his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. The wisdom, I'm sorry, this wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, Full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown by peace, uh, sorry, is sown in peace by those who make peace. Chapter 4, verse 1. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and you do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Last Sunday, I titled our sermon, Watch What You Hear. Today, 
in equipping our, our title could be, <laughs> watch what you say. But that would be jumping the gun, because watch what you say is a subordinate point to the main point that James is instructing us in chapters 3, verses 1 through 12, and that is simply, don't become many teachers. Don't become many teachers. That's the point of verses 1 through 12. And I wanted to read for you all the way through chapter 3 in the first half of chapter 4, because I wanted you to see some of the connections here. We're actually in the middle of an epistle that could be summarized with this theme statement, James is writing to give us tests of a living faith. In other words, how do you really test and scrutinize if a faith is real or legitimate? How would you know if a faith is bona fide? Is it actually saving? Is it effective? Is it the real deal? It's easy to claim faith. Anyone can claim faith who has the ability to make an articulation about faith. All that takes is a minimal amount of knowledge. But we can be self-deceived. In fact, there's nothing more deceitful than our own hearts, Jeremiah tells us. And so a profession of faith could possibly be the most deceitful thing we could possibly do is to simply profess that we have faith. So the question then becomes, is our faith living? Is it bona fide? Is it real? Is it salvific? Is it effectual? And James is writing to to explain that and to highlight that there is something that's going to be unique and and, uh, something that becomes incredibly encouraging, giving rich assurance to believers when they look at their faith and they realize it wasn't just an assertion. It wasn't just a proclamation. It wasn't just a boasting, hey, I've got faith. It was actually proven in life. It was tested. It was run through the crucible of suffering. It was run through the crucible of biblical tests, not just doctrinal, but also practical. And it came out on the other side shining. It came out proving that this is a divine faith. It was given to this individual by God. And when you see your faith, and you can look at tests of a living faith that come from God, not just tests that we might think are good tests of faith. Ah, Of course I'm a believer. Everybody else thinks I'm a believer. No, James doesn't say that. The tests of a living faith, when when they come from God's word, they're infallible, and you can trust them. And So we find ourselves in the middle of this incredible epistle, and, and almost every single section of this epistle just continues to build on, on, on what <clears throat> precedes. And it's an incredibly connected epistle. Um, sometimes the book of James has been viewed, I, I've even heard commentators call it the uh, New Testament equivalent of Proverbs. Just kind of a string of proverbial instructions and kind of lo- loosely connected, if at all. And as I've studied the book of James, I've just been really impressed by its connection. I don't think that there's anything lacking in the connection here. Um, it's just overwhelming how, how, the, how tight the connection is. It's not necessarily as linked together in like a lawyer-type fashion with tight conjunctions the way Paul might write, but it actually is very tightly knit. And when we find ourselves here in chapter 3 talking about this topic of let not many become teachers, James, I don't believe, is at all launching into some random discussion. He is still focused on tests of a living faith, and he's writing to the church of the diaspora. These are the Jews who have been spread because of persecution throughout the inhabited world. So from Jerusalem, you read it in Acts chapters 1 through 7, from Jerusalem, they they launch out all over Asia Minor, all the way over to Rome. and, And so here, James is writing shortly after the diaspora to the churches who have scattered, the Christians who have scattered. And these Christians are ministering in all of these contexts. And these Jews, in fact, any Jew who has the gift of gab, and I'll call it the gift of gab. I'm creating spiritual gifts, right? That's not a biblical category. You don't find that in Romans 12 or 1 Corinthians 12. The gift of gab is just the ability to talk. These Jews who would have been highly equipped from a a church like Jerusalem under the leadership of James, hearing preachers like Peter and, and, and been, would have been familiar with Paul, and, and they've been incredibly exposed to theological truth, and they live in a theologically rich environment, and then they get launched out because of the diaspora, because of persecution, and they find themselves in other cities like Antioch or up in Galatia, and these churches now have somebody who is, has incredible ability to talk, and they can make incredible professions, incredible claims. And James is is warning them about a very real danger. Verse 1, 
could be literally translated, you must not become many teachers. You must not become many teachers. He's concerned about a proliferation of teachers. He's, a, he's, wor- he's worried and concerned about the impact and the dangerous, damaging effect that that will have on the church and on those many teachers. And he talks about both of those in this section. And so the nature of this warning is against the multiplication of instruction of instructors. It's not just a warning against equipping teachers. It's not a warning against um, equipping others who can teach well and who can uh, shepherd and disciple and make more disciples. It's not a warning against um, even, honestly, having multiple teachers in any one church or even, comparatively speaking, having more teachers in one church than the next church. It's not a warning against any of those things. Those could be blessings so long as this warning is heeded. Having more teachers, as long as this warning is heeded, would be a blessing to any church. But this warning has to be heeded. So the warning about heaping up teachers is a warning that is rooted in a heaping up of teachers that's unaware of occupational hazards that go with teaching, especially when you have teachers who can profess and have the gift of gab and can get put in a position where they're going to have a lot of influence on the church. But the question would be, is their faith a living faith? Talk is cheap, and people with the gift of gab can do it. But the real issue is not whether a teacher has the ability to talk, but whether he has the ability to tame his tongue. That's the better test. And so James gives us this incredibly important warning. And um, he just starts in verse 1 by saying, you must not become many teachers. You must not become many teachers. Now, this passage, this, this section we're looking at this morning, it certainly has a ton of implications. Because all of us open our mouth and talk. We all influence. We all email, text. We all have uh, correspondence. We all have communication. Um, so instruction just happens. I mean, words carry weight. Words influence. And when words change the way someone else thinks or they impact someone, then some form of teaching is occurring. So this has a lot of implications for all of us. But of course, when he's talking here about this category of teacher, like a role of teacher, he's talking about an actual role in the church. And so though at times as we work through verses 1 through 12, I'm going to apply it even outside the category of an official teacher in the church, That's certainly the the first and foremost focus of this passage. Paul even says in 1 Corinthians 12, 29, all are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? And he's talking about an official category, a role in the church. And this is a specific role. And and there's qualifications for teachers in the church. And um, we can see that in uh, all throughout the New Testament, and especially in an official capacity of, a, of an elder, overseer, pastor, who is to instruct the church, one of his, his, his only non-character qualification is the ability to teach. Uh, everything else is character. And so it's interesting that Jews were rebuked by Jesus. Remember this? In, in Matthew chapter 23, remember when the Jews were rebuked by Jesus, the scribes and the Pharisees were rebuked because Jesus said, you seat yourselves in the seat of Moses. And now, in, in that day, it wouldn't have been, uh, it would have been opposite of custom of today. So today, it's like, okay, we got a pulpit, and I'm standing and you're sitting. Um, it would have been opposite. They, the teacher would be sitting, and the seat, kind of like we have a chair of a department, you know, a department head at, of philosophy at Arizona State or whatever. That's like a chair. That's an official office. It's an official role. Well, the reason it's a chair and not a podium or a pulpit is because that's, that's the actual heritage, is that the teacher, the recognized expert, would have the chair. They would sit down in the chair. Uh, when uh, the, the pope is supposed to speak infallibly, he speaks ex cathedra, from the chair, from the throne, at the, at the Lateran church there in Rome. And so 
Here, here's an, an example where Jesus is rebuking the, the scribes and the Pharisees because they seat themselves in the seat of Moses. They, they take this teaching role for themselves. They've asserted themselves. They're, they're, they're self-appointed. They're self-ordained. They laid hands on themselves. <laughs> they just said, yep, I'm the teacher, and, and I recognize my, my own uh, authority here. And so they're self-made. And James is um, picking up on the concern about all the proliferation of teachers. And uh, he's actually telling them, you must not be multiplying teachers. And, and I would say that there's, there's something to be considered, to, to remind ourselves here. We, you know, we have a, a rich Protestant heritage. And um, we cherish the doctrine of the priesthood of, of all saints. You know, the, the all, all believers are, are ministers. We, we are all called to serve to minister, to carry out uh, the ministry in the church. Uh, there are certain roles, like as Paul describes in Ephesians 4, um, pastors, teachers, evangelists, um, and even lists uh, apostles and prophets. Those, those kind of roles are all instruction gifts, and they equip the saints for the work of ministry. So if we have a proper ecclesiology, we know who... Who, who, are the, you know, who are the ministers in this church? Well, let's look at the, let's look at the list of members. If we have a proper ecclesiology. The, 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 mem- the ministers in this church are the, are the members. And there are certain people who maybe do a little bit more equipping than others, but we are all carrying out the work of the ministry. And so ever since 1520, Martin Luther actually wrote that this doctrine needs to be reclaimed against the Roman Catholic Church because... Um, they maintain, the Roman Catholic Church maintained the superiority of clergy um, and, and even secular authorities over the, the, the state and over the church. And he said, look, there, there needs to, instead of this clergy laity distinction, we need to remind ourselves that the Bible teaches priesthood of all saints. All the Christians are doing the work of ministry. And so we have this rich heritage, and we come to a passage like James 3, this becomes helpful, a helpful antidote, because there's nothing wrong with the priesthood of all believers but there could be something wrong with just imagining, hey, you know, priesthood of all believers, it's just, yeah, we're all doing the work of the ministry, it's, we're all the same. And James is sitting here saying, no, look, stop multiplying teachers. There should not be many. You don't, don't, just, don't just go for the, the, the high bar of as, having as many teachers as you can possibly have. Everybody with the gift of gab, official teacher. Devastating. That would be devastating to the church. We don't want to ignore the very sacred calling of the teacher in the church, and, and James won't let us do that if we pay attention to what he says here. So as we work through these verses, here's the way I'm going to, I'm going to work through this. Uh, simply put, why you should not become many teachers. He gives us several reasons why you should not become many teachers. Well, why not? Why shouldn't we multiply teachers? Why shouldn't we become many teachers? Why shouldn't we just heap up more and more and more Uh, teachers in official capacity. Wouldn't the church be better with more teachers? Not if you ignore these reasons, not if you ignore this warning. First of all, in verse 1b all the way through 2a, uh, here's the first reason. Because of the greater accountability. The greater accountability. Let's not forget, James says, we know that as such, that means as teachers, we will incur a stricter judgment for we all stumble in many ways. He just reminds the, uh, the Christians here receiving this letter, he reminds them that they know there's going to be a, in what's translated a stricter judgment. And the NES has a great footnote, greater condemnation. And I think that's actually the, the, the better way to go. Perhaps the best way to go is the the greater of the footnote with the judgment of the body. <laughs> so if you use the, in, in the footnote, it says greater condemnation. We'll take greater because that's a very literal translation and then just stick with judgment. So a greater judgment. Greater judgment is the issue here. I don't, I, I'm not a huge fan of the term stricter here because in, at least in my mind, I might not be typical, but in my mind, the term stricter has the idea, it evokes the notion of a different standard. And there's not a different standard. Um, Matthew 12 Verse 36 is very clear, and it applies to all of us, and this is going to be a universal standard, but listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 12, verse 36. Jesus says, but I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. And now that, 
That's a universal standard. And so if we, if we use the word stricter here, we might start to imagine that, oh, okay, well, mm, certain people have a different, there's, there's this kind of standard for this person, and there's this kind of standard for this person. And um, you know what? Every last one of us is going to give an account for every idle, vain, useless word. There's not different standards. But the word is not stricter. The word is greater. The word is greater. There's a greater judgment for teachers. In fact, it's interesting, in Mark 12, 40, and in Luke 20, verse 47, Jesus twice talks about the leaders of Israel who were doing teaching. And he says that they will receive a greater judgment. But he doesn't use this. The word here in James is megos, just greater. It's like a bigger judgment. The word that Jesus used is a word that kind of means abundant, an abounding judgment. And it, when you, you, know, you put all this together, greater judgment is consistent with both the leadership role and the amount of speech involved with teaching. And I don't think it's a different standard. It's just that there's a lot more responsibility and there's a lot more talking going on where words are many sins abound, right? I mean, it's just hard to talk long without seeing sin come out. And so that's the nature of this warning, knowing that as such, as teachers, we will incur a greater judgment. Well, why? Why are you saying that, James? Here's the answer. Because we all stumble in many ways. The issue with teaching is not ability, but character. We all stumble in many ways. And so uh, as a teacher, when you're in front of people and you're trying to teach truth to God's people, you are obligated not only to get the message right, you're obligated to live it. And the problem with just heaping up teachers, especially ones who can profess, especially ones who can make great claims, especially those who profess faith, and especially those with the gift of gab, doesn't necessarily mean that they're not stumbling in many ways. In fact, he says we all stumble in many ways. And so not stumbling isn't a category, of, it's not a standard for a teacher, or, or else there would be no teachers, and he doesn't say let no one be a teacher. He's actually teaching apostolically as he writes this letter. But that's the reason why we shouldn't multiply teachers, knowing that we incur a great judgment because we all stumble in many ways. The great judgment is connected directly to the life It's easy to, you know, I think you guys have probably all had this experience when you're trying to evaluate a, a ministry or get familiar with an author. You pick up a new book and you, oh, he's, he's, a, he's a professor at a certain institution or he's a pastor at a certain church or he's been involved in a certain movement or there's a certain website I can go to. And so you pull up a doctrinal statement or you're listening to a sermon download and you're like, ah, oh, who is this guy? And you, so you go to the church and you find the webpage and there's a doctrinal statement. And I, I, you know, sometimes I hear people say, man, I, I, I was so blindsided because he said something crazy in this sermon, but then you look at his doctrinal statement, it's really good. And it's just, it's just so easy, isn't it? There's just a, a paper doctrine. I like to call it a paper doctrine. It's, it's what comes out on paper. It's, it's what's written on the doctrinal statement. It's what comes out when you ask someone their doctrinal position. It's their answer when they say, explain this theological position. Um, people who are teachers probably have a lot of ability to give those answers, and even websites. Uh, in fact, one time I, I remember talking to a particular church uh, that was, was asking me to come and pastor there a few, several years ago, and they, and they said, hey, come, 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 we'd love for you to put your name in the, in, in the hat here. And so uh, I, I, I looked at this church's website, and it was interesting. I said, hey, your, your website is, uh, is like word for word, with, with, or I said, it looks like you have a lot of influence from this organization. It was a no nationally, internationally known organization. And they said, no, 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 we don't have any connection. And I'm like, and I'm sitting there thinking like, no, it's actually literally a cut and paste. Like I'm looking at both websites. I'm looking at the organization and their church. It was literally a cut and paste. And it's just that easy to have a doctrinal statement, to have a profession of faith that just doesn't really cost you anything. It's just that easy. It's just talk is cheap. There it is, doctrinal statement. The better question of what you believe is what you do. The better question of your view of inerrancy and inspiration is not what you say in your doctrinal statement on that section of the doctrinal statement. It's actually how you handle the word. 
A better demonstration of what you believe about parenting is not what you say about parenting, but how you parent. It's an incredible standard here on teachers. We have churches that look identical in their doctrinal statements, but their body life is radically different. And it gets connected to this very principle that James is writing about, knowing that we will incur a greater judgment because we all stumble in many ways. I mean, the issue with the teacher is going to be character and what they live out. There are several uh, things that are essential. There are several elements that are essential for corporate obedience, for the obedience of the church, for, for Grace Bible Church, to, to be the body of Christ, the, the, the arms and legs, uh, the lighthouse for the gospel for, for Tempe and Phoenix. There's, there's a lot of things that go beyond the doctrinal statement but cannot exist without the doctrinal statement. The body life and the vibrancy of this church, our ability as Christians to d- make disciples effectively, the depth of uh, our, our, our skill and being able to meet spiritual needs and, as, and to push and pull one another toward spiritual maturity. I mean, these things are going to be determined. The standard of what that looks like is going to be determined by the practice of the teachers. Teachers teach by their lives, and then when they're in the pulpit, they use words. And so... The godliness, the holiness, the humility of teachers it sets the bar for those standards in the church. The relationships modeled by the leaders exemplify what biblical relationships look like. The speech of teachers demonstrates whether or not they have a living faith. And in turn, it sensitizes or desensitizes the rest of the church to those tests of a living faith. And so we can see that this greater accountability is massive. Now, the second reason, now it's going to start picking up pace here. So we're going to have to definitely, it's going to start moving because these sections get a little bit bigger. I just wanted to take some time and explain the connection there in 1A and to 1 to 2A. The first reason you shouldn't become many teachers is because of the greater accountability. Secondly, the tongue's prevalency. The tongue's prevalency. The, the word prevalent is just, it means superior in force or power or predominant. There is a, a power, a powerful influence, a, a prevalency in, in force of the tongue over the life. And that's what it describes in verses 2b all the way through 5a. Let's look at what James says once again. Pick it up in 2b. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. And now in 2 B, when James says the word perfect, he's been using that word um, quite often, and it means, it means um, mature or maybe even better in this context, complete. He's a complete man. It has to do with arriving. We, we might use the word perfect and, and mean it without flaw, and that's not really part of this word. We, when we use in English the word to perfect something, like you've perfected such and such a skill, it means you've really like mastered it. That's more the idea. It's you've, you've you know, instead of being a, a novice at something, you've really mastered it. So you've arrived at the end. You've come to the conclusion of your training. So there's a, you've perfected that ability. So that's, that's, what he's, that's the way he uses it here. This is a person who, you, 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 kind of, you kind of arrived. I mean, there's like a, a maturity. There's a perfection. There's an arrival at, at a man who has uh, the ability. He doesn't stumble in what he says. If somebody doesn't stumble in what they say, that, that guy's arrived. <laughs> that's the idea. He's arrived. I mean, that's something you know, by way of character. Able to bridle the whole body as well. And so the issue here is how powerful and how influential the tongue really is over one's life. And he moves into some illustrations. Verse 3, the bit. Now, if we put bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. And so you think about a bit and bridle, the bit being the part that's actually in the mouth. The bridle goes around the horse's head and, turn, you know, and it connects to the reins, and so you can steer the horse. Um, you know, if you've ridden a horse, you understand how that works. Um, I've read many horses. I've never read an untamed horse. <laughs> I've never had to break some wild stallion. You know, yeah, I watched that like in old westerns as a kid, and I'm like, man, that guy's amazing. He just calmed that horse wild, you know. I get on a horse, and it's like, just follows the horse in front of it, or just, you know, you just kind of like walk it around, and maybe get up to some speed, and 
I've had like one horse get away from me and it responded to me. It's like, okay, not, no big deal. If it's under control. Uh, I grew up in Kansas and I had a classmate who was uh, uh, ranked in the top 10 in amateur team roping. And so watching these guys, you know, uh, you know I, I wasn't really, you know, much into rodeo. I just kind of got moved there from, you know, my family moved out there from Wichita. And so I was more into basketball. They're into rodeo. I'm trying to get somebody to shoot hoops. They're over there roping, you know, the horns off the bale of hay. And so that, that was the environment that I grew up in. And I had a friend named Chris who had this, you know, 10 or $20,000 horse. And it was so highly trained, you know, and it, those, those team roping horses, they know exactly which ear the, the lariat's coming off of, whether you're going for the head or for the back two uh, hooves. Uh, a calf roping horse is so highly trained that it knows when it sees the lariat go past its ear, it slams on its brakes, it throws in the hooves, and basically chucks the cowboy on top of the calf so he gets there quicker so he can flip it up, tie the three hooves, and he can tie out in, in the quickest time as possible. I mean, these horses are incredibly trained. And notice that all those examples involve horses with bits in their mouth. The bareback or the bronc riders, there's no bits in those horses. <laughs> they are angry and they are ready to go. There's not a bit in their mouth. And those guys have to hang on. I mean, that, that's obviously an example where we don't put a bit in the, in the mouth because the whole point is we are not trying to control the animal. It's an obvious illustration. The bit controls this entire massive beast. Verse 4 uses a naval illustration. Look at the ships. Also, though they are so great and driven by strong winds, they are still directed by a very small rudder wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. Now, if you've looked at some uh, large ships and vessels, you might know that there, there is such a thing as a large rudder. Uh, the Nimitz-class nuclear-powered aircraft has a 29-foot-tall rudder. That's a pretty large rudder. But still, comparatively speaking, just to put that in perspective, the rudder weighs 110,000 pounds. That's 50 metric tons. But the whole ship weighs 99,000 metric tons. And so I did the math on my calculator. And uh, it's 0.05%. That's five thousandths of the entire ship. I was kind of like, I don't even know what that means. And so I did the math on my on my. Uh, on my own body weight, according to what Google told me was the weight of my pinky, and half the weight of my pinky to the weight of my body would be the ratio of a rudder of an aircraft carrier. It is like almost inconsequential by way of weight, by way of size, but it determines everything about the ship. It determines where it goes, when it turns, and how fast. All of that is determined by the use of the rudder. And so his conclusion, verse 5, so also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. This is the prevalency of the tongue. It might be small, but it actually determines everything about your life. You can see the course and, and direction of one's life uh, by looking at the tongue. The tongue is massively influential. And so in verse 2b, when he says, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well, He's picturing the influence of the tongue on the person's life. It's interesting. This is what surprised me as I was studying this week. It, it seems as though verses 2 through 5, the emphasis in James's exhortation here is not so much even the impact of the teacher on the church, but the impact of the tongue of the teacher on the teacher's life. And that's the direction he goes in verse 5b through 8. And this becomes our third reason why you shouldn't multiply teachers, because of the tongue's uncontrollability. The tongue is uncontrollable. It's untamable. 5b, James says, see how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire? And he actually, it's interesting, he actually uses the same word for forest as he uses for the, the fire. It's the same adjective. And it just kind of means like what size of, like see what size of fire is, is, see what size of forest is burned up by what size of a fire. And so it can be how great or how small. And so he uses the same word, and obviously in the context, he's talking about, look at what size of fire is put on, started by such a size of a spark. <laughs> what, how, how great of a forest fire by how small of a, of a spark. And so the issue here is very negative. The focus is very negative, and that's, the, that's consistent all the way through the rest of our passage. The negative 
uh, effects of the tongue, specifically how uncontrollable it is and how much damage it does. And that becomes important to even think about it before we dive into this section here. Uh, talkers often make the worst teachers because talk is cheap. What demonstrates faith is not a teacher's ability to talk, but a teacher's ability to control his tongue. And look how much damage is done by such a small, small organ. Think how much damage is done to the glory of God when the tongue that's supposed to exist only for God's glory goes a different direction. Verse 6 says, And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. I mean, the tongue is just a, a world of a, a, a iniquity. It's its own cosmos of sin. And this is a, obviously a very negative description of the tongue. And the scriptures have a very high view of the tongue's capacity for doing good. If you look at the, the capacity of the tongue for edifying purposes, for example, you have, you have passages abound on how gloriously blessed the tongue, the, the, those who hear words uttered that are faithful with Scripture, with the motive of building up, with the intention of serving and meeting spiritual needs and pushing and pulling others with those words uttered in that context in a customized fashion for that individual to get them more like Christ. And the Scripture is not, a, not, not embarrassed to highlight the positive value of words. But here, James is showing its negative liability, its incredible danger, because it's uncontrollable. It's like a fire. The tongue is set among our members, he says in 6b. It's set among our members as that which defiles the entire body. And so here, you, you might have some, a, a, whole, a whole view of the capacity of one's life, and you could just view it in a neutral fashion. You've got all these opportunities in front of you. You could do this, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this, and it all gets defiled and stained and soiled and perverted because of the tongue. That's a powerful picture. Think of all the things you could set your hand to, all the things that you could do in the church and in your life for the sake of Christ, and to think that all of those opportunities could be soiled, stained, perverted, and defiled because of your tongue. That's powerful, and it's just out of control. He says it sets on fire the course of our life. The tongue is the, the spark that inevitably consumes the forest of one's life in a consuming fire. All of those faculties, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, hands, and feet, things that you would do and say and contribute to and be a part of and serve in, all of that just getting lit on fire, going up in flames. Because the tongue has not been tamed. I remember visiting Yellowstone. Our family went to Yellowstone when I was in the second grade. And I, I believe it was the following year. Uh, in 1988 was the famous Yellowstone fire. It was interesting watching the news of that, seeing these incredibly beautiful forests and national park just go up in flames uh, a year or two after I was there. And we went back there. My family went back there just a couple of years ago. And uh, we even saw some areas of the forest that were still the remnants and the effects of that fire back in 1988. And it was started by apparently 42 counts of lightning and nine human fires contributed to that massive conflagration that took down a massive portion of Yellowstone in the late 80s. Here James is using that same image of what the tongue would do to one's life. It's, it defiles the entire body and it sets on fire the course of our life, the whole direction of our life, all of our usefulness, all of our contribution to the church for the sake of Christ, for the benefit of our families, could just go up in flames because of the tongue. I mean, this is, this is powerful. This is absolutely powerful. And finally... Last description, and is set on fire by hell. And this is 
wow. <laughs> I mean, James, I like James because he doesn't, you're kind of like, well, you're kind of using some vague language here. Can you tell, really tell me what you're getting at here? I mean, this is just, it's set on fire by hell. And that's just as strong, but I, I do realize also, even as I studied it this week, I, it, I'm just like, wow, that's, that's, a, that's strong language, but I still was kind of left wondering, what does it look like to actually have your, your tongue, because it's, it's still referring to the tongue here, your tongue set on fire by hell. So my tongue burns up, could, could burn up everything in my life if it's not controlled. But then my tongue is in turn, passively, set on fire by hell. It's ignited by hell. It's being lit up by hell. And I thought, well, that's an interesting picture there. Uh, Gehenna is the Greek transliteration of the Hebrew. It just means, Ge is the Hebrew word for valley, and Hinnom is the, is the valley there south of uh, the Mount, Temple Mount, uh, west of the Kidron Valley. And it's where trash uh, was burned outside of Jerusalem. And so you can see it being defiled in several accounts, including uh, 2 Kings 23, you see it, it had been defiled by those uh, in, in Josiah's day. Uh, they would uh, do pagan sacrifices there in that valley. Uh, in Jeremiah 7, it's still being referred to where they are ac ac sacrificing children to Molech in uh, the valley of Hinnom. And um, Jesus talks about uh, Gehenna in Mark chapter 9, and um, talks about the fire not, uh, the not dying, and the, uh, I'm sorry, the worm not dying and the fire not being quenched, because it was the trash heap. And so they would burn their trash, and the maggots would come eat everything that's decomposing, and he's just comparing that actual literal valley and that literal destruction with a spiritual condemnation and an eternal destruction, uh, which was intended, according to Matthew chapter 25, um, for Satan and his demons, and all who die in their sin are put there righteously by God as their judge. James is pointing out that the place that's created to punish Satan and his demons is fueling the tongue and making it so untamable. The location hell is, is a sort of euphemism here. It's a, it's a euphemism for satanic and worldly influence. In fact, in the next text, if you skip down to chapter 3, verse uh, 15, you remember this? We just read it. The wisdom, this is not wisdom which comes down from above, and he's comparing and contrasting wisdom from above and wisdom from below. It's, it's er heavenly wisdom versus earthly wisdom. And the earthly wisdom is described three ways. It's earthly, or the wisdom from below is, number one, it's earthly Number two, it's natural. And number three, it's demonic. So wisdom from below is consistent with demonic thinking. It's absolutely opposed to the things of God. It's focused on the things of self and the things of man. That's just demonic thinking. It's absolutely satanic. It's perverse. It's all fueled by lies and murder and destruction of souls. And that's what... James is pointing to when he says that the tongue is set on fire by hell. It is satanically flamed, and it then it devours your whole life. I mean, what would Satan want to do more to damage the church than by way of a teacher who has the ability to talk theologically for an hour, but he cannot tame his own tongue? What greater damage could he do to a church than by influencing it through savvy speech contaminated by perverse living. And so the, the tongue is set on fire by hell. And so now, look at this. He says in verse 7, every species of beasts and birds and reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on of the animals we've tamed, and even sea creatures kind of strangely sea creatures, but that's one of the four that are commonly referred to to talk about the inhabited world. But just think of sea world, an orca whale, you know? And it's just like the, the, crazy, the crazy things that human beings have done by way of, you know, taming wildlife, taming animals, the animal world. And of course, you know, some trainer gets killed and we hear about it in the news because we're in a cursed earth. But what's interesting is, there's, you're just like, what, what species have we not tamed? It, everything is tamed by the human race. It is tamed and has been tamed. We have that capability. But here's where capability stops, is in verse 8. 
but no one can tame the tongue. Um, orca whale, check. Lion, check. Bear, check. You just list it out. Just start going through the animal kingdom. Tongue. Eh. That's where the ability stops. Number, uh, verse 8, I don't believe is an overspeak. I think James is speaking very straightforward. No one can tame the tongue. And yet the obligation is you must tame the tongue. And this obligation is placed upon us and it's outside of our capability. He's not exaggerating, like no one, I mean, some people do, some Christians do, but virtually no one, no, he's saying no one has that capability. It's very similar to Mark 10, when Jesus says how difficult it is to enter the kingdom. It's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then the Jews, in their mindset, were looking at the rich people who are so blessed and so um, fortunate financially, if I mean, if, any, if God shows favor to anybody, it's the person who's rich. And so if the rich can't even enter the kingdom of heaven, what about the poor people? I mean, what's, what chance do we stand? And they ask the right question, well, then who can be saved? In other words, no one can be saved if that's, the, if that's how difficult it is. And Jesus says, what's impossible with men is possible with God. It wasn't overspeak. It is impossible with men, but it's possible with God. And so verse 8, it's the same way. No one can tame the tongue. It's not an exaggeration. That's fact. No human being has the power to tame their tongue. We are, we are absolutely dependent on divine ability to tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. And the word restless is, means unstable. In fact, if you go back for a second, turn back to James chapter 1, um, for a second, look at, look at verse um, 5. If you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously, and without reproach it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. Being a double-minded man, unstable, there's our word, unstable in all his ways. He now uses that same word to describe the tongue. The tongue is unstable because we are unstable. In verse 8, it's a restless evil. It's an unstable evil, full of all deadly poison. It's just, it's absolutely lethal. It bears fatal potency. It's as unstable as the human heart. And so, why should you not become many teachers? Because of its uncontrollability. I mean, this just puts the idea of teaching and the role of teaching and the effect of our words in a different category, doesn't it? You think about how un uncontrollable our tongue is, that should cause, cause us great pause to think about our teaching. The last reason is in verses 9 to 12, and we'll be quick here. The tongue's duplicity. The tongue's duplicity. This is connected to double-mindedness, duplicity, and instability. This has been all throughout the book of James, and here it is specifically applied to the tongue. Verse 9, with the tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who've been made in the likeness of God. Men are created in the likeness of God, and we're going to say, bless God, but curse the one created in his image. That's duplicitous. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things shouldn't be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? You, you, you've never seen a, a water fountain that spurts out <laughs> salt water and fresh water, let alone a natural spring. Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs? Neither can salt water produce fresh. It doesn't happen. It is impossible to think that somebody could be a good teacher and bless the name of God because they do so for one hour when what comes out of their Mouth is untamable sin against God. This Thursday, I was, I woke up at a fairly normal time, got some coffee, got to dive into some reading of the Word and studying, and Thursday's a big study day for me, and so basically from six till about four, I had a, the massive majority of those minutes went to 
Uh, I just read, read the book of Zechariah, and I got to read some, some, some stuff that I was looking forward to for, for Sunday morning for, for, for the main service here coming up, and looking at James 3, and uh, just having this great time in the Word, just being so godly, and Four o'clock, uh, Owen has a basketball game. April and I jump in the car, and we, jump, we, we, we were driving over to school to, what, to, to see my son play basketball. She asked me one question. One question. And this is a nine-minute drive. And she just said, hey, da 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 here's her question. And I start launching, and I'm like, okay, let me answer that. Da-da-da-da-da. Nine minutes later, we get to school, and she says, you're complaining. Hmm. And she asked me, well, how is it that you were studying James 3 all day? <laughs> and uh, you get a nanosecond break from James 3, and what's coming out of your mouth is complaining. And I started thinking about what I was complaining about, and literally the answer that, 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 that came was, well, yeah, that's a good question. Probably because what I was studying was different than, what I, than, um, than this issue. I'm glad Omri laughed. <laughs> I wasn't laughing. I literally had to look at my answer, and I just, it's like, there my words are, staring me in the face, indicting me. Look at the garbage that comes out of the same spring that is supposed to be devoted to speaking the glorious riches of our God. That I could turn right around and actually imagine I'm just thinking about this issue or this topic or this discussion over here, and oh, this is great, let's talk about this. And yet what it is is a complaint against God, either in his character or his providence or his outworking or in some theological fashion, I have found a way to complain against God with the very same organ, the little tiny tongue. It's supposed to be devoted to speaking the glories of the one who saved me. There it is. There it is. Don't become many teachers. I just want to encourage you to think about the implications of this. Consider how quickly you could write, speak, communicate. In personal conversations, you might have a reaction. You might think and speak quickly. Letters and emails, texts, social media, posts, comment threads, even likes likes of photos, likes of articles, likes of things that have content. You're giving an affirmation, and there is instruction in even what you're promoting digitally. Think about um, what you like by way of a repost, even reposting content. Think about it as parents, how often we can find it easy to speak truth at a formal time with a Bible open, talking with our our kids and having a discussion about the implications of truth at school or on the sports field or in church. And yet, the test of our duplicity is it's not Bible time with the kids, it's, it's normal, everyday occurrences. The nine minute drive when a conversation starts to reveal complaining where our tongues can give a clear window into our heart and they can demonstrate the consistency of our claim to believe. And that's a help to us, to give us great pause. If, you've, if you're finishing this exhortation and you're feeling like, man, that's all I can resonate with is verse 8. No one can tame the tongue. You know what? If you lack that, praise God, we know where to go to find that lack. Go back to chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. God, uh, James writes, let endurance have its perfect result, its complete result, so that you may be complete, perfect, or mature, and complete, ha- lacking in nothing, lacking in nothing, having nothing that you need, having no-, no void that needs to be filled. But then verse 5, but if any of you lacks wisdom. So the result of endurance having its complete result is that you would lack nothing. But then in verse 5, he says, but if you lack wisdom... Let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. And so let me just drag that concept out of the discussion on suffering and lacking wisdom into this discussion of taming the tongue. He who lacks the ability to tame the tongue, let him ask of God who gives to all generously. God gives us the ability to tame the tongue so that our speech and our instruction would be useful, 
fruitful, glorifying to God, beneficial to those around us. And then our faith is proven, though we're not perfect, we're proven to be a child of God because our faith is actually producing control over our speech. That's the blessing of this kind of exhortation. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for James 3. It's such a, such a powerful uh, rebuke to us in our speech. And we uh, just thank you, Lord, for the incredible ministry that that's having and will have as we think about the implications of not multiplying teachers and thinking soberly about the nature of the tongue. Lord, we long for our speech to be glorifying to you. Teach us in these coming weeks of these equipping hours what it looks like to be, have wisdom from above, to be uh, filled and fueled by you, to have true humility, to have uh, the, the, the grip of this world, have its grip relinquished by the superior power of des desiring to please you and cultivating a friendship with you. And so we just pray that you do that for your glory in our lives and, and in this church. We pray this for the glory of Christ. Amen.